Father God, I decree that my head is anointed with oil, Father God. And I decree that it's not by mind nor by power, but it's by your spirit. We decree that we're children of heaven and not of earth. So we accept our citizenship, oh God. And we drown out, oh God, the noise of the earthly realm. In Jesus' name we pray. I would say amen and amen. Praise God. You may have your seat. May God have his way in this house today. It's an awesome thing to follow the leading of God and then understanding comes. See, it's not every time God tells you to do something and says, okay, this is X, Y, and Z. He just says, do it. And then understanding comes. And understanding always builds faith. For any, if most of my leaders were around, you, uh, you may not know. You may not know, but oftentimes when there's a series that God lays upon my heart, I know months in advance or at least a month before what I'm going to say because that's the grace that God has bestowed upon me. Praise the name of Jesus. That's the grace that the Lord has bestowed upon me. So as we're coming to December, the Lord says, I don't want no little baby Mary's boy child. It says, I don't want my people to celebrate me and not receive what I've brought. It says, the utterance for December will be a victory. And the song will be, hallelujah, you have won the victory. Death could not hold you down. The very first person I called was Pastor Mar. I said, Pastor Mar, this is what, where the Lord is leading me. And the utterance for December will be victory. And uh, I said, you know, I want you next week to minister this song. But Pastor Tazio and his dates are always off sometimes. So that was actually last week in uh, November. Uh, so I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not ministering. Pastor Murray, uh, Pastor Rich is ministering. So Pastor Maureen, I don't know, the late will, will begin the first week of December. Uh, Pastor Rich, I have no idea that I've been speaking to Pastor Maureen about this. So Pastor Rich comes and he minister on the last uh, Sunday of December, fight the good fight of faith and hold on to your confession. And he ministered on victory, having had no idea what Pastor Maureen and I was ministering on. And then we began, Pastor Maureen sang hallelujah, and we're like, okay, I guess God, you, you ain't trying to start, a, this is not the first of December, this is as, I've, as, the, as you told me the word is active, it's victory. Now, understanding is key. I'm sitting at the back of the church, and Pastor Maureen was the first one I called, and I said, this is the song you're going to utter. And Pastor Maureen is here praising God and singing hallelujah, I've won the victory. After testifying that within one week, Satan literally tried to kill all three of her children. You got to hear what I'm saying. This is November. This is way before any of this stuff manifests. First person I called and I says, the theme and the utterance for December will be victory. And the specific song will be, hallelujah, you have won the victory and death could not hold you down. That was a sp I, it's not like I rhymed this. I said, this is a song that the Lord wants to utter. And let the praise and worship team know that this must be uttered through December. I don't know why. God just says, this is, this is a sermon and this is it. And I see Pastor Marine up here in her blue singing her praise. And I said, God, that was supposed to wear a black dress in mourning. Her children, them, all of them should have been wiped out. But the utterance was victory. You guys got to see the church ain't about this. We're just here doing rituals. This is, this is real stuff. There's an evil force and there's a good force. And there ain't no middle ground. This is real stuff. This is understanding. It's not by chance that she was the very first person I spoke to. Even before I spoke to Pastor Nazan to tell the worship, I said, Pastor Mar, I sense that the utterance is victory. And Jesus said clearly to me, I am tired of my people celebrating me but not receiving what I've brought to earth. Tell them victory and receive the victory. And this is the song. And I said, Pastor Maureen, this is a song that must be uttered. And she sang it. And the last Sunday of December, she's singing it, but is no longer doing this. It's a reality because death came and victory was won. When Pastor Marie was telling me the story, I said, Pastor Marie, if it was one child, it would have been, and if it was two, I'm like, okay. But it was all three, and all three was in a situation that they should have died. Should have died, and the spirit realm of heaven intervened. And God says, I don't need another Job. I had a Job already. Leave her children alone. 
You touch the car, but leave the boy. Because there's no more Job. I had my Job already. Death could not hold him down. We begin to understand that this ain't no joke. There's an utterance of victory. And we ain't shifting. And as she's worshiping, I, I hear the God says, Tell my people to come up higher. Because the noise of the earth is destroying and trying to oppress our faith. And I heard the Bible talk to me about Elijah. And Elijah was up on a mountain and everything was good on the mountain. But he descended and when he descended, a voice spoke over his life and says, you're dead tomorrow. And then Elijah went into the wilderness and began to be distressed in spirit. And God sent an angel to so go feed that boy. Feed him and strengthen him and tell him to return back to the mountain. Because when he was on the mountain, he was good. But the minute he descended off the mountain, the earth noise rose up and spoke over his life. So it says, strengthen him and bring him back up to the mountain. And then in the mountain, he's going to learn not to listen to the noise. The earthquake is going to come and, and it's going to shake and there's going to be thunder. But he needs to overcome the noise of the earth and hear the sounds of heaven and, and receive the voice of heaven. I hear the God says to John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 4, come up higher that I may show you heaven's reality. Because heaven's reality don't always coincide with earth reality. So he said, John, come higher. Come above the noise of the earth and the utterance of the earth and hear the utterance of heaven and align yourself with the utterance of heaven. Oh my God, you, you see the noise of the earth sometimes oppress us in some ungodly ways. And God says, feed him and bring him, tell him to go up. Climb the mountain and hear my voice. Understand it is good. Because there is a reality. And we are not going to align ourselves with the noise of the earth. God will be done, not ours, but it better be God's will. Oh my God, somebody ain't hearing me. I don't know about you, but when I see the manifestation of something, because now I'm in full understanding. Before I was in obedience, but I was not yet in full understanding. Because the, the, the manifestation had not yet come, I'm just trusting the Lord. But now I saw the manifestation, I said, okay, this stuff is real, real, real. I thought when we got victory of our frustration, that was good. But now that went to a whole different realm. Ah, uh, my I don't know, Pastor Richard, the folks are understanding what was supposed to be the last Sunday of December was not supposed to be the daughter with her hands in the air saying hallelujah. That was not the design of the enemy. Pastor Rich preached, hold the, your, the confession, stay on your confession, fight the good fight of faith, and something happened. And I said, God, this is so heavy, maybe I should switch uh, what you have told me to preach on, on Christmas Eve. And God said, stay the course. You overcome the enemy by the word of your testimony. Tell them the how to enter into the presence of a king with praise and thanksgiving. In all things, I will give God praise. Maintain your confession and your testimony. That's what he preached the last Sunday of November. This is all real, folks. I say, God, let me shift up this message a little bit. Based on the noise and the issues that's happening around me. God says, maintain the course. Finish what I've sent you to do. 1 Samuel chapter 5, chapter 6. Sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 5. Understanding Bill's faith. Just that was real. But the God that loves you will not allow the enemy to win over you. One, maybe... Two, I'm going to have to really fight to say maybe it's a coin, but three? And I'm talking about legitly trying to destroy? Now at that point we say, okay, God. But God don't need multiple jobs. We all go through job situations, but sometimes I, no, I don't need her. I know her heart already. I know no matter what happens, she's not going to change her testimony. So we don't need to go through this all over again. Verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 5. And after the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashad. They carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. 
When the people of Ash had rose early the next day, there was, a da there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place, but the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Hashat sat on the threshold. And the Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Hashad and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashad saw that saw what saw sorry, when the people of Ashad saw what has happened, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us, and Dagon our and Dagon our God. And they called together all the rulers of the Philistine and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of God. So they moved the ark of God to Israel. So it's not out of the land yet. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron came out. They have brought the ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people because they got wise. And they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death, and death, for death had filled the city with panic, and God's hand was very heavy on it. And those, did, those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the, the city went up to heaven. Where does our victory come from? What's the origin and the source of our victory? The origin and the source of our victory is the God that we serve, who has become victorious and who is victorious. One thing I learned about Satan, Satan likes to, he likes stuff. Satan is the hoarder, the first hoarder and the master hoarder of all things. He likes to take stuff. That's why the Bible calls him a thief. He just likes to capture and take things. I'm telling you, that's what he does. He's a, he's a massive hoarder. He sees something that looks good. Whether it be you or me, and he wants to take it into his position and hoard it. And he figured that he'd have learned in heaven that some things are off boundary. But he thought that he would capture God himself and hoard him into his temple. And because the people of God rebelled, they figured that that defeat that the people of God had when we started off in December was linked to God himself. So they decided to take God and his ark. The ark of God represented God. And they decided to put it in their temple Dagon. And if you know anything about ancient times, that when armies went to battle in ancient times, one of the first things they looked to take captive of is the God of the people. They, they always looted the temples of other nations and take their God as a sign to the nation that, listen, your God can't save you from me. It was a common practice. So that's why Nebuchadnezzar cleaned out temples no wherever he went to because it messed with people psychologically. Like, if I'm praying to this God for me and this God was taken captive and put in uh, Babylon's temple then really you're going to have a you ain't going to find hope because your God got you got taken captive and your God got taken captive so it was really a massive psychological warfare that the armies played on other people and they always looked for their temple and took their gods because it's hard for those people to rise up if your God got kidnapped also so that was, a, that was a common practice in those days. And that's when you read the Bible, you always see God's being taken into temples. So the Philistines thought, well, I'm going to give uh, Israel a real blow and, and tell them that if, uh, I'm going to take their God because if their God can't be delivered out of our hands, then they have no hope. And in their pride, they decide to take the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the temple of their God as a sign. It's always a common practice. And they woke up the other morning and they, 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 their God fell down and said, oh, oh there's something strange happened. I don't know what happened. Let's put him back up. And they went. But when they came the next day, not only is he fallen, but his head is gone and his feet is gone and his hands are gone. And, and now no, this is no coincidence. We recognize now that we took something that we shouldn't have. We took something that cannot be taken and cannot be taken captive. And they began to learn that. But practices continues throughout the ages. 
And Nebuchadnezzar figured that he'd be a bit bigger and better than uh, the, 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 the Philistines. So he comes and once more again, because the children of Israel rebelled and they experienced defeat, they associated defeat with the God of Israel. So we'll take their stuff again. And the son of Nebuchadnezzar raised up and I'm like, yeah, of course my father took them captive. Let's, let's drink out of these golden stuff out of the temple. The Bible says a hand started to write on the wall and says, your kingdom is done. You're done. Everything's done. Because God cannot be taken captive. The Bible begins to tell us in, in the, the book of Kings that there's a time when Assyria and his king came against Ezekiel and his people. And they're trying to, take, they're trying to discourage them. Uh, and the commander says, listen, we have, we have gone against all these nations. We have kidnapped them. And where is their God? Can their God save them? Humble yourself and come into captivity. And Ezekiel say, God, do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear how he's blaspheming your name? When God, God says, listen, by the time this man reached back, he's done. By the time he, God turned them back into defeat and sent them back home, this man was killed by his own sons, I believe. You see, the victory that we have is because of the God that we serve that cannot be taken captive. And that victory reigns in our life. And every time Satan tries to take the things of God and the people of God captive, he learns a harsh lesson. And, and, and the Philistine says, listen, the hands of God, this is so profound, is heavy on us and it's heavy on our God. It's not only heavy on us, but he's manhandling our God too. He's manhandling our idols and he, he's manhandling our demons. And, and to save our God, we need to get rid of him because he's just manhandling everything. That was so profound. They didn't just say themselves, but it says that God is going, he's going to just, there won't be nothing left of Dagon. At least we have a little stump left. But unless, if, if we don't get rid of him, there's going to be the ashes around here. We got to get him. And as he began to move from city to city, the last city says, no, 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 no. We ain't falling for this. Don't bring this ark anywhere close. Because at now we know who is the real God. And it has repeated itself. Pharaoh was considered to be God of Egypt. And he decided that he's going to have a fight with the God of heaven. And God says, sure, why not? And then when God began to loose himself in Egypt. You see, the first two miracles, the magicians are doing the same thing. They're like, yeah, we can, we can contend with God. You want to throw your rod down? We'll throw a rod down and we can contend with God. And God says, that's cool. Let me begin to up the ante and see how much he can contend with me. And after a while, the people began to curse Pharaoh, their God, because Pharaoh was a God in Egypt and says, get rid of these people before we're all dead. They began to curse their very God because their very God was obviously losing to the God of Israel. And they were reaping the consequence. So they, they stopped worshipping their God and began to curse their God. And said, get rid of these people before we are destroyed. Because anything that contends with God always lose harsh. So the victory that I have, people of God, is not that I have attained it. The, battle, the Bible says the battle is not mine, but it belongs to God. The victory that I have in my life is not past the times that I attain it. I am walking in the victory of, of God who is serious in warfare. That's why he's so merciful. He's very serious in warfare. He's so serious that when Jesus showed up, the demon says, I, have you come to torment us already? Uh, we don't want this battle. Send us in the pigs, but we ain't trying to fight you. Because we recognize how fierce you are. So when God says victory in the land, uh, we're not looking through our lens. We're looking through the God that humbled Dagon and humbled Babylon and humbled Assyria and crushed Rome and bring down kingdoms and lift up kingdoms. And if God can't be captive, it means that his children can't be captive. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's, a, it's another analogy that gives who God is. It, it, and it said, in St. John chapter 1, it says that light shines into darkness and darkness can't overcome it. You know, one of the things about light is this. Light is proactive. Light is offensive. Light is not retreat. When you turn on light, darkness removes itself. Light always steps into the environment and change the environment. Light doesn't play defense, it conquers. Can I say that again? Light does not play defense, it conquers. Light does not try to defend darkness because darkness cannot intrude on light. It's an offensive image of God. Light does not play defense, it conquers. 
The Bible does not say uh, darkness shadows into light. Because darkness cannot shadow into light. So dark light has no need to play defense because by the very nature of light, it conquers darkness. So light is never retreating, it's always going forward. When God said, let there be light, there was no fight. Darkness ran. Light does not play defense, it's offensive. Darkness cannot shadow into light. Do you guys understand? Darkness cannot shadow into light. For you to see darkness, light must re remove itself. So God says, I don't play defense, I conquer. I overcome. I swallow. I destroy. I shut up things that stands against me and my children. There's nothing great enough for me to retreat. There's nothing great enough for me to play defense. I only go forward. That's why I always command my children, go forward. Stop standing still, but go forward. Because when you recognize what's reigning in your life, you recognize that ever you overcome by the power of God that does not go backwards. There's no scripture of God stepping backwards. There's no scripture of God saying, this enemy is a good foe, so I must take a step. Everything that God described himself, I am a conquering lion. I'm ferocious. I go forward. I consume. I swallow. So when the enemy rise up against Pastor Marine and have to face that God, you could understand why the outcome was the outcome. And all God asks us to do is invoke him into our life and invoke him into the earth so that way he could stand against the wicked one. Turn on the light and darkness will retreat. John 8 said, I am the light of the world. But sometimes we don't understand, so God says, let, let me tell you this now. I don't have time, but the Bible talks about three realms. Heaven, earth, and beneath the earth. That's why the Bible talks about three keys. Key of David, key of death and hell, and the key, of, the key to the kingdom of heaven. Speaking about authority in all realms. Three keys that the Bible mentions. One in Revelations 1. One between, I think, Revelations 2 or 3 about the key of David. One in Matthew 16 about the key of the kingdom of heaven. I have dominion in the heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in the heaven. I have dominion over the earth. I set up kingdom and I pull them down. And Satan thought he could have created hell and, and escape. But I also have dethroned him and take the key of death and hell. And I now have dominion even in hell. So he went to John and he says this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. In his right hand he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-headed sword. His face shined like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand on my head and says, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I now hold the keys of death and hell in my hands. I have now conquered all realms, was his testimony to John. He says, I am the first and I'm the last. I died and went to hell, dethroned Satan, and I have the keys. That's what the Bible says, what God opens, nobody can close. And what God closes, because he now has the master key to all realms. You see, until Christ came, the death realm was owned by Satan. And he occupied that. It was the last realm to be conquered. And the resurrection told us now that all realms belong to God. Why is this important? Hear me people carefully. Death can only capture death. Death can never capture life. Just like how darkness can never shadow into light. Death can only capture death. The only thing that Satan can capture to hell is that which is dead and don't have the life force of Christ Jesus in it. Death can only capture death, never life. It was the greatest mistake Satan made, not understanding that formula. And he thought that he could swallow up life because Christ didn't sin, so there's no death in him. 
uh, I, and listen to me, this is a principle. The lesser cannot conquer the greater. The lesser cannot conquer the greater. So because Jesus did not sin and there's no death in him, when death tried to swallow him up, it had to open back his mouth and say something greater came into a realm. And Jesus says, thank you for the mistake. Give me your key also. Because there's some things I need to set free. That seed of righteousness, that life force is no joke. The lesser, Pastor Rich, cannot conquer the greater. That's why Jesus says the strong man, he's good. Everything's all right with him. When a stronger man shows up, he binds him and he takes everything that belongs to him. Because that's his principle. Yeah, I better not go fight Brother Jamil when he's buffing out of his shirt like that. Because if I go up against him and I don't seem to have, and he's more powerful than me, it is a butt whooping. And what is worse about that is that at least I had my jacket and I was good. But now I went and disturb him and he beats me down. I was like, give me your jacket too. He didn't even initiate it. I did. But because he initiated the warfare, there's a principle that comes with warfare. The victor always spoils the goods. So now that you initiated the warfare, it happened with Abraham and Sodom. And when they initiated the warfare, now not only do you lose, but you lose what you had before. I should just let him be the <laughs> Pastor Marine. What am I prophesying to you? You see, you got to understand that this is not a, a zero-sum game. You see, when the enemy attacks you and he's defeated, that means that you get more than he had before. Oh, my God. I believe by the power of God that there's something that was sown in your children's life that God is going to water it and bring it to fruition because we must understand this is not a zero-sum game. That when the enemy attacks you and he's conquered, then there's stuff that you gained that you didn't have before. It is a principle of warfare. Pastor Rich, if you attack me, God Almighty, don't lose. Because if you lose, not only do you lose, but you lose what you had. Because it's the principle of warfare. If you attack Job, not only does he get back what he had, but he gets back more because the goods must be spoiled. I decree victory in the land. I decree victory in the land. I decree the utterance of heaven over the noise of earth. Makadaba Soto. I decreed over the voice of Jezebel. Come up high, your children of God, and hear the voice of God. Let me wrap up. Let me wrap up so we can pray. We stand our ground, Pastor Rich. What did you say? Hold the confession of your faith. That's what you started this whole thing off with, right? Did you not start off with fight the good fight of faith? Oh, my God, I thought I was the one to lead it, but you let it off. In the name of Jesus, stand your ground and hold your testimony and hold your praise no matter what you're going through. In the name of Jesus Christ. Because the God who's for us is greater than anything that could be against us. There's a lot of noise around me. Don't think that I'm all feeling all good and preaching. But God says, Elijah, go up higher. Go above the voice of Jezebel. Go above the voice of the earthquake and the thunder and hear the sound of heaven. Children of God. The battle does not belong to us. As we end, this is the prayer. Exodus chapter 14. We have time to do everything that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> my Lord, my Lord. Pastor Marine, I think, I, I, I think I'm, I'm winning some of the fruits of your victory. The understanding began to build faith. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? <laughs> People of God, sometimes we get distressed in warfare, not understanding if we'll stand our ground and win. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not like Satan retreat and you stay where you were. You gain things that you didn't have before. Fight the good fight of faith because God has told Satan to become a blessing in our life. Uh, the very weapon that he used against us. Uh, oh my God, in the name of Jesus, uh, I hear the Spirit of God rise up in me. Balaam, I, uh, Balak hired Balaam as a weapon against the children of Israel. And God intervened. Uh, and the very weapon became a blessing. And I heard God say to Balaam, instead of cursing them, you will now bless us uh, because I've changed the weapon and the warfare and I've captured something uh, and what was supposed to destroy you is going to now bless you 
is not profound. That there's a weapon past the rich uh, that was hired in the spirit realm uh, that was on its way to bring destruction. Uh, and God met this man on a donkey and sent his angel and draw a sword and said, if you make another step, you will lose your head. Uh, and this is now what I command you. You must now bless and not curse. Uh, for what God blessed, no one curse. Uh, and the weapon of destruction became blessing. It is a high risk that Satan takes when he attacks your life. Uh, because if by chance you will stand your ground, uh, it's not a zero-sum game anymore. But you become greater than you was before. Wouldn't that have been better if you just let Israel alone? Balak said, what are you doing? Balaam says, I, I can't do nothing but bless them now. Because God has intervened uh, and he waged war against me. I'm trying to keep my head on. I don't want to be foolish like Dagon. Uh, I'm trying to keep my head to my shoulder. So I am going to obey God and bless his children. Because I'm up against a greater force uh, that I can't stand against. Uh, and although I love money, <laughs> I'm going to have to reject your money to save my head. This, this is the God. We, we, we like to pretty God up too much. Uh, but when the enemy is coming against us, we don't want that pretty God. Uh, we want the God that the Bibles reveal. Uh, the God of fire with a sword that's always drawn on behalf of his children. I don't want that cuddly God uh, because the Bible did not reveal that God to me. It revealed the God that went to hell uh, and bound Satan and conquered him. That is the God that I serve uh, in the name of Jesus uh, that says, children, the battle is not yours, uh, but it belongs to me. The God that says Jezebel stand your ground and be still because I will fight on your behalf this is the kingdom of God Lord Jesus you don't know until you go through what this all means and you don't know until you truly surrender your life what this all means because you don't see things, you don't understand things, and everything's just a coincidence, and I was just lucky. No, that is a lie. You were saved by the grace of God. Because it wasn't luck that put you in that situation. It was an evil force trying to harm you. I had no understanding, but I was willing to obey and say, this is a word for the house. Let me slow down so we could pray. We know the story of Pharaoh's heart and heart and his foolishness. You see, Satan, we need to understand. Forget Satan. Pharaoh thought that his battle was the children of Israel. Well, who, what's the God that the children of Israel is serving? You think he's going to stay on the sideline? Sister Mary... <laughs> It, 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 Satan thinks that when he comes up against us, uh, it is just Pastor Taz. You, you, the first question he needs to ask, who's the God that Pastor Taz is serving? And is Pastor Taz real about his faith? And is he real about walking his faith? And if the attack box is yes and yes, then you must understand that you're invoking the God of Pastor Taz in the situation you raise up against him. Now if I'm a messing around and, and hopscotching Christianity, then, then that's a problem. But if you assess that, okay, I really believe in Jesus uh, and I'm taking him at his word and I'm standing on his ground, then that means that when you come against me, you're invoking the God of heaven against yourself. And at some point, God pushes me back and says, stand still, I got this. This ain't your issue and your battle anymore. You go behind me. I got this. But in the battle, there's always a command. Because Jehoshaphat was not supposed to engage in battle. But he needed to praise. You see, though we don't fight, there's still commands in the battle that we must believe. And I heard of God says, listen, what was the confession that my, I commanded my people? Decree that your head is anointed with oil. Uh, the same oil that David had on his head uh, that allowed it to kill Goliath. Uh, decree that greater is he that's within you than whatever is working against you. Because in the battle, there's our command and instruction. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm a child of God. This little foolish boy. But there's something great that's within him. In the name of Jesus Christ. So Pharaoh thought, 
This warfare is against me and Israel. Well, who's Israel serving? And who's Israel praying to? God says to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people. I have seen their tears and it's ringing in my ears like a loud bell. And I've come to, down to deliver them because their prayer is ringing. I saw the angel went, I said, worthy. But they still had the prayer of the children of God in their hands as they're worshiping their God because of the linkage. Maintain your confession. Fight the good fight of faith. So now once Pharaoh's now pursuing Egypt, and at this point now they're all in the Red Sea. <laughs> the Israelites in the Red Sea, poor things, they didn't have full understanding, trying to run for their life. And the Egyptians saying, we got them. That's where the story picks up. But this is what Jesus, the Bible says, verse 23. The Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's houses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Remember I've said many a time, this is his best. During the watch of the night, hear me carefully. Verse 24. Mark that if you're going through something. During the watch of the night, the late night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian's army. The, the Lord looked what? On whom? Your enemy that is trying to pursue you. And threw it into confusion. No weapon what? He jammed the wheels of the chariots. So that they had different difficulty driving. That's disarming. That's disarming. The weapon is of no use no more. And the Egyptians said, let us get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. One thing I learned about God. Do not start a battle with him because he does not permit retreat. Watch every battle that God fought. That's why God says, count the cost. That's why there's no return for Satan to heaven. Because God is this, this is the side of God we need to understand. Don't start the battle because I don't give retreat. As a matter of fact, a king was disqualified, Saul, because he didn't understand that principle. He says, the Amalekite I will always have war with because they attack my children in their vulnerable state. And there's no retreat for them, so they must be wiped out. And Saul says, the pretty little stuff is good, so I'm going to try and keep it. And God says, have you ever seen me start a battle in the Bible and not finish it? People are not permitted. Joshua said, son, stand still until all the enemies are gone because that's a heart and the mind of God. God don't want your enemy to rise up next season against you. He he wants you to conquer all of it in this season. He doesn't want there to be another Esther book up where there's a king that's rising up because somebody left a task undone. So the Egyptian says, we need to run. Too late. You're in fight in a battle of a God that does not permit retreat. Let's stand, let's stand, let's stand. The battle is not ours. Pastor Rich, I'm going, to, I'm going to hear the instruction of heaven and hold my confession and fight the good fight of faith. I will conquer frustration and I will maintain my praise uh, and the confession that my father is good uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and today I'm going to pray on your behalf uh, that God will look down on your life and see whatever is trying to pursue you and that he will address it and don't permit any retreat for it.